Welcome to Will Wright's book. So, the story so far is I've been wanting to write a book or books. I've never written a book on my own. <clears throat> written two editions of a book for MIT Press with Dan Friedman and Oleg Kislyov and the second edition with Jason Heeman. I've started a number of books on my own. I've never finished one. Um, and I want to write. I want to write a book. So I originally started off this year. Um, that was that was actually my main sort of personal goal for this year was to write a book. And sort of the Kilo Tube challenge, trying to make a thousand twenty-four YouTube videos this year, that was more like an offshoot. Um, I wanted to create things, and you know, I wanted to communicate with people and share things I think are interesting and learn from other people. So anyway, so making the videos is part of that. Um, but the main focus was on the book. Um, <clears throat> started making the videos first. And then I thought, okay, well, making a lot of videos, maybe I'll try to write a bunch of books. And I was going to do 11 books this year, one per month remaining in the year. 10 months left now. And I started... Experienced wrist pain immediately when typing, so I got the fancy keyboard and you know went on this whole uh, sort of journey, and uh, and started working on a book on creativity and that sort of thing, and it was getting kind of meta and it was going to be about the the videos themselves and the experiment, and then I took some time off because I sort of couldn't make videos for a while. And when I was taking some time off, I realized, well, you know, when I came up with, when I started thinking about the other 11 books I had proposed for a second book, I thought, hey, I could make something on the, the talk I gave, the most beautiful program ever written. And a couple of people responded to that and they said that that was a great idea. And, you know, it seemed kind of obvious to me. It's like, oh yeah, of course, you know, this thing I really care about. And then when I came back, I was like, you know what, let's focus uh, effort on that book. You know, for, forget about this book on creativity. Maybe I'll come back to that. But, you know, th this book I feel is like a book that that I need to write. Um, and uh, so I've been thinking about that book. One of the things I did was I downloaded an MP4 of my talk and MP3 and I um, used... Uh, whisper technology and some app on the Mac with the, head, the whisper model to create a transcript. And I started looking at the transcript and cleaning it up. And I also, um, since then I have, have gone back and looked at my emails and correspondence and Twitter DMs and all that about how did that talk come about. A lot of my recollection wasn't quite right in that, I thought, or I remembered, I was in New York for Lisp NYC talk. Well, that part's true. But for some reason, I thought that only when I was in New York was I invited to give a Papers We Love talk. And that wasn't true. So actually, I knew about the talk for a while. And I even sent an, um, an abstract and readings that basically were like the, the final talk. So I certainly was thinking about it. On the other hand, I definitely recall, you know, being very nervous that day. And then I did find a message or an email I sent to someone about like, yeah, I can't do anything right now. I'm, I'm worried about these talks. And I, you know, didn't get much sleep because as I guess for the first talk, I didn't get much sleep. It's interesting going back and reading that and saying, oh yeah, that's not exactly what I remembered. Um, and I did think that the first talk, I certainly had, in, I enjoyed Lisp NYC. I did have some problems, uh, AV and the recording didn't, ended up with like without video or something. And there were some AV issues when I was giving the talk, uh, but I got to meet really interesting people and talk to talk with people. And, you know, so that was the overall experience was, was enjoyable and positive and I'm glad, glad I did it. And, um. But I definitely remember 
And so often when, I, when I'm saying I'm going to give a talk or something like that, yeah, I'll have a, a rough outline of things I'll talk about just because, hey, people need an abstract so they can advertise the talk or whatever. So I did that. But there's a big difference between saying, oh, I think I'll talk about these things and what I actually end up talking about. And so, you know, I think when I was in my hotel room in Chinatown, you know, my bed, uh, you know, curled up trying to think what I'm going to do, you know, that was sort of like, well, here are a bunch of topics I I said I'm going to talk about. How in the world do I put those together in a coherent talk? So anyway, I went went back and reconstructed much of that history and made a little timeline for myself um, just so I could kind of cash that back into my head as to what was going on. And I, I realized, and also talking to a couple of friends about this, um, I realized there are at least four different books that I could write that would be in inspired by that most beautiful program ever written talk. So one talk, or so one book would be what people have often done in the past where it's like literally just a talk, slightly cleaned up, get rid of the ums and so forth. You know, like they're, if you read the books uh, by Richard Feynman, those are mostly recordings of him giving a lecture or you know, for the Feynman lectures, people cleaned it up. It was a lot of work to clean it up and add all the figures and everything. Uh, but for, for some of his talks, like QED, the book on QED, that was from a lecture. And even the Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman, those were basically transcribed, uh, cleaned up versions of stories he told uh, to Ralph Lightman um, that were recorded. So, and and also I think von Neumann, like a uh, number of his talks, or at least one of his talks end up being a book. And, you know, there, there's like this long tradition on having, you know, lectures end up in books. And before things like YouTube, that, that probably was just a necessity because, you know, all right, well, if you weren't there, what are you going to do? Um unless there was an audio recording made. And even if, even if so, how are you going to get it? Is like, you're going to have a f- record of a von Neumann record <laughs> of a lecture. I mean, I guess maybe people would have that, but, um, you know, I think often those would just be turned into books. So that'd be one way to go up to do it. Um, say, like, okay, there you go. Maybe have like a, an introduction or something. Then there's what I would call the landmark treatment. So there are these landmark, um, the landmark Thucydides, the landmark Herodotus, things like that. Um, This very nice series of historical books, mostly ancient Greek, ancient Roman books that I think maybe they're all ancient Greek and ancient Roman books. Uh, But things like the histories of Herodotus or uh, the... Peloponnesian War, the history of Peloponnesian War by Thucydides. And the books, I mean, I remember as an undergrad trying to read these books as like a cheap paperback version that might have a couple couple footnotes, but I had no idea what was going on. And they're talking about different parts of ancient Greece. I didn't know, I, I didn't know anything. I, I think they had like some... some uh, you know, l- tiny, uh, low resolution map in the front of the book. And it's like, okay, good luck. Uh, you know, that might've worked in an era where people were learning Greek or Latin growing up, but I didn't learn any of that. So, um, but the landmark books are very different. And in fact, the landmark, uh, Herodotus, I think is really, really fun read. It has all these ancient stories, you know, that Herodotus collected, and it has maps like every other page or something. There's a map showing what's going on um, and all sorts of footnotes. And and then there's a bunch of appendices in the back that talk about, you know, by experts talking about different aspects of, of uh, either the work or of life in ancient Greece and things like that. Uh, and, and those books are, are really amazing. They're thick. Um be maybe a little weird for me to do that for my own book, you know, do the equivalent, but I could imagine doing something like that. 
Um, actually, both of those options, you know, either just taking my talk and turning it into a book. Well, I, I guess maybe that's a, a less narcissistic version, but the, the landmark treatment, you know, the equivalent would be sort of the, the, the really narcissistic version. Um, so those are two ways that are really very um, talk centric, like, you know, literally you're taking the text of the talk or a slightly cleaned up version and using that as the, you know, for the book. Um, and so one question for the first version where literally it's just the, the talk slightly cleaned up, well, is that really necessary? I mean, can't you just, can't someone watch the video? Well, maybe, maybe you know, that video on YouTube doesn't have um, subtitles for whatever reason. I did notice that. So maybe it makes it a little more accessible for some people. Um, I guess it can be translated into another language. Maybe, maybe that would be useful. Uh, but in general, I don't, I don't know how much value it adds, especially now that we have the ability to download the audio and get a transcript from it that's actually pretty clean. Um, so I don't know. That, that first option... I think it would have made sense uh, 50 years ago or 70 years ago. I don't, I don't know. It makes much sense. It doesn't really inspire me. The landmark treatment. Yeah. I was thinking about doing something kind of like that. Um, I think that would be an okay book. I mean, it would be, if someone liked the talk, then, you know, it's really um, sort of an annotated version of the talk going into details. And so I was thinking, you know, there'd be topics, all the topics that, that were brought up in the book. I'd talk about that a little bit in a bunch of like little mini, mini lessons at the end. Hmm. That could be, that could be a book. Um, I think it would feel very different than the performance oriented talk. Cause that talk was a performance. It had a lot of humor. Like maybe I could do a book like that, that had some humor. Um, the reaction from my friends for that proposal <laughs> was not, uh, <laughs> they weren't, they weren't impressed with that idea, let's say. <laughs> uh, partly because I think they like, they think the talk is like a good, you know, that's a performance and it's a different media. And so, you know, if I'm recapturing the talk, which was this oral performance with live coding, you know, is, is the dynamic nature of that going to show up in a book? Mm, I don't know. Um, maybe, but I think I think the book would have to be written differently. So another book would be, I mean, another approach would be like the Hitchhiker's Guide, you know, Hitchhiker's version. Like imagine Douglas Adams, you know, writing writing up the talk and with humor. Well, yeah, you know, could do something like that. Anyway, so those are sort of the first two options. And then a third option would be to write a book whose topic and development of that topic are inspired by the book. So maybe follows the same topic development, but which is just a book. And even though if you hadn't heard the talk, you wouldn't know, you know unless you read the, the preface, you wouldn't know as originally a talk. It would It would be just a book. It would be its own thing, and it would have some connection to the talk, but but not too strong. So that was what I was leaning towards. And then uh, today, actually, I think a little bit yesterday as well, but today um, I woke up relatively early and went to a coffee shop and spent a couple hours, you know, just thinking with a notebook. Yeah, I guess I, I had started to develop this idea yesterday. Um, and, and I, I actually brought two notebooks, one I was writing in and one from last year. And the one last year included a bunch of pages of notes from July of last year, where I was really thinking hard about, well, what can I make, you know? So, so it's not, not like I just decided this year to make a book. I mean, I've thought about this stuff for many years. And in July of 2023, 
Mm, I was thinking I wanted to make something more like doujinshi, um, which is like Japanese fan work um, for like Toho Project or Kamaket or whatever. There's this whole subculture. Um, yeah, it's hard hard to describe it in a pithy way. I could give it a much longer description. But in any case, um, there, there's a certain charm to those books. And I guess I would say that they're like fan works. And one of the interesting things is even the professionals make fan works. So, you know, I am a fan of relational programming. I'm not just someone who works in it. I actually like, I just think it's really interesting and really cool. Um, how useful it is right now, I try not to worry about too much because I do think that over time, I mean, I think there's a long history of things that were totally useless when they first started. And over time, uh, they became useful in various ways. Even now, there are people who debate whether or not functional programming is useful, for example, um, even though it's starting to get traction. And a lot of people debate whether or not object-oriented programming, at least either, either sort of the version we've ended up with in most of the mainstream languages or the LNK version, you know, if that's useful. You know, so people talk about these things. It's not like we have universal agreement on whether or not these things are useful or holding us back. Um, but, you know, I am a fan of relational programming. I'm not, you know, I'm somewhat of a fan of Mini Kenrin, I guess, but it's more like the relational programming I'm a fan of. Mini Kenrin's a way to explore that. It's like sort of a, sort of a notation we have in, a, in, a, in some implementations that are not ideal because, you know, I think the ideas of relational programming are far richer than what we can currently express computationally. Um, but in any case, you know, I am a fan of that style. And so what I was thinking about last July was sort of this doujinshi inspired work. And the title was Infinite no, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> Imperishable Wonderland of Infinite Fun, which is the name of the Discord server um, for this, for the Kilotube channel and all that. Um, you know, that's where that name came from. And so this is very inspired by like Toho Project and just, and I have pages and pages of, of titles. And I, you know, I thought, okay, well, I need a subtitle for that. I need a subtitle for it. And I tried various things and, Anyway, I've got probably a hundred different subtitles, but I was having trouble <clears throat> kind of latching on something concrete. You know, it's like all of relational programming. And okay, that sounds like a vast topic. Is this going to be an encyclopedia? Is it going to be 20 volumes? You know, how do I get my hand, how do I get a handle on this in a way where you know, I don't bite off this gigantic thing and then I give up after six months or something because it's just too big. Um, and and I, I struggle with that and I never really got a handle on it. So I kind of gave up on that, although I still like the title uh, a lot. And, and I even was drawing the covers, like, hey, this is what the cover is going to look like. And, you know, I figured it all out. Like, this is, I could even publish a Japanese edition in Japan and, you know, Zen Comics and Akihabara. Or sell it at a doujinshi fair for computer science. I don't know. I was just having fun with the idea. Um but in any case, uh, today I was I was going back, and you know, really yesterday I was going back to this idea, maybe even before, but certainly by last night I was thinking about it seriously. And I think I've got a title here. <clears throat> See here. Oh yeah. So by the way, um, you know, one of the concerns that I have, the one reason I, I was a little nervous of going down this direction is, you know, I'm, I'm a little worried about being too precious. Like I thought when I was making that book on relational programming Alpine style, 
I thought well, that, that wasn't so much being precious. That was like being clever. Maybe I had this conceit that I could teach functional programming, relational programming, programming, relational interpreters and functional interpreters and program synthesis all at the same time um, in this kind of like minimal bootstrapped way, which maybe would have been awesome had it worked, but it, I couldn't get it to work. I think that was just being a little too a little too clever for my own good. But I'm also worried about being a little too precious for my own good. It's like, oh, this has to be the perfect book. You know, it can't be released unless it's uh the book is covered in fine Corinthian leather or something. Well, <clears throat> I'm not gonna have a leather edition being vegetarian, but anyway, um <clears throat> Yeah, so that was part of the, the concern. And I was thinking about it with the talk. So I don't think the talk that, you know, when I say the talk, I mean the most beautiful program ever written. I don't think a talk was precious. It was just, it was, um, it had personality. You know, it was like, it reflected my personality and my point of view. So I want this book to reflect my personality and my point of view. That talk was a talk only I could give. Even if someone else, <clears throat> someone I worked with, <clears throat> excuse me, excuse me, even if someone I worked with who knew all the material as well as I did, even better, if they gave a talk on the same topic, their talk would be different because I mixed in a lot of my own experience and my own perspective and my own approach to humor and things like that, uh, a lot of storytelling. So that's something only I could do. And I want whatever book I make to be something only I could make. Okay, once again, doesn't mean it's because I know everything or that I know more than other people. Uh, I, there are a lot of people who actually know a lot about relational programming. I don't. Um, so it's not about that. It's not about knowing everything. But, but, it, but I, I want it to have my personal point of view and my personality and you know it doesn't have to be like i don't know <laughs> uh so there, there are some people who label everything with their name on it i won't mention anyone it doesn't have to be like that i'm not talking about that i just mean um yeah i don't know the the books i really like you can tell that it was like a band, right? Like there, there are certain bands where even if you've never heard that song before, uh, you could just tell from from the sound, you know, even without the lyrics. Like just like how how the the guitar sounds or the drums or things like that. It's like wait, you know, I remember the first time I heard was a Deer Maker or whatever. It's like wait, is that a Led Zeppelin song? It's like yeah. It's like oh, I never heard that one. Um, it was just like that sound of Bono's drum playing kind of instantly tell anyway uh i want it to feel like that i don't want it to feel sterile i don't know how to explain it um and i and i, I don't want to be precious about it i think that's a different thing but it you know it should feel like it came from me with all the good and bad things that that implies um and that might mean some people don't like it because they don't like my style or something that's fine but um it's not a textbook and it's not, you know, it's not a Bourbaki uh, theorem proof, uh, remove all humanity style. It's not that like that at all. It's going to be my book. So, and, and when I was thinking about, when I started writing down the titles in July and also to, today, uh, I would look at the title and for a couple of the titles, and one title in particular, I started getting nerd chills as Artosis, is a StarCraft commentator, commentator, says it. I don't know. Like, what's a nerd chill? A nerd chill is like when um, when you see something or think about something or there's an idea and it just kind of gives you the shivers. Like, it's just so awesome that uh, you almost, your body almost can't handle it, right? And so... There are certain things like that. Um, 
it was it's almost like an overload, a sensory overload, but it's like an intellectual overload. It's like, oh my gosh, I didn't know this existed, or, or I really want, you know, like I just, I just found out about this thing, and that's one of the things about these Toho project, um, album names in English. And my Japanese is too bad for me to really understand the titles in Japanese usually, but, but in English the titles are awesome. I don't know. I just like really like them. They're, they're best in aggregate. You have to like read the whole list of Toho Project games. I shouldn't say albums of games. Um, and so Imperishable Wonderland of Infinite Fun, that name is sort of a Toho-ish name. Okay, that's like a Toho-inspired name. But of course, there's all sorts of references to relational programming, if you think about it. Um and also functional programming. So I, I love that name. And that's the sort of name I was writing down in July last year. I just like wrote pages of these sorts of things. And if it gave me that nerd chill feeling, I thought, okay, this is something that I respond to. Okay. I don't know if anyone else does, but like when I read those Toho names, Toho project names in English, not all of them, but some of them just give me this feeling I don't know. It's just, uh, anyway, so when, uh, yeah. So anyway, I was getting some nerd chills. Uh, so I, I want, I want to write a book that gives me nerd chills. I mean, if anyone else gets nerd chills, that's great. But, you know, ultimately I want to write a book that it's like the book I wanted to read. So the title currently Okay, any of this is subject to change. Okay, it's all subject to change. But I think I'm getting closer. So the current title, An Imperishable Wonderland of Infinite Fun. Subtitle, Relational Reflections on the Most Beautiful Program Ever Written. Um, so for the, first, for the title, I can't... I'm trying to decide between imperishable wonderland of infinite fun or an imperishable wonderland of infinite fun. I kind of think an imperishable wonderland of infinite fun sounds better. It somehow softens it. Imperishable wonderland of infinite fun sounds kind of harsh in a way. Also implies there's only one, but I guess it doesn't have to. An imperishable wonderland of infinite fun is longer. Generally don't like longer, but Somehow it feels right. And then relational reflections on the most beautiful program ever written. Well, so this is me trying to connect these titles. So I had all sorts of other subtitles having to do with relational voyages on the seas of computation and things like that. I was going to approach all of computation relationally. And it's like, wow, that's a lot. Um, so I, I'm not so sure about the subtitle. Uh, in a way. So, you know, it's like I had different versions. The most beautiful program ever written, a relational view, something like that, or a relational view, or relational views of the most beautiful program ever written. So right now it's relational reflections on the most beautiful program ever written. I think that's a good title if the book has reflection in it as the programming language concept and reflection relationally. If it doesn't, then I probably would want to take that out and change it because I, I don't want to. Uh, I want every word to count in the title. Um, and so, you know, this is what I want to focus on is the most beautiful program ever written, which is that Lisp interpreter. But the relational version of it in particular. So it's like, OK, so this book would get up to speed you know, it's like, okay, here's what you need to know to get into this artifact. Uh, but the, the focus of the book is on the relational perspective. And in particular, there are a whole bunch of interesting things having to do with a scheme interpreter in scheme in the relational interpreter in scheme. You know, uh, it's like the last example in 2017, ICFP Pearl showed Quine synthesis using back quote and comma 
where backquote and comma were implemented in a scheme interpreter, a tiny minimal scheme interpreter that itself was written in a scheme interpreter that was written in Minicanron, which was written in scheme, which is like five levels deep. And we could synthesize um, these quines using back quote and comma. And if you do a staged evaluation, you can actually do that with some reasonable speed. Things like that. And then there's a whole bunch of, of versions of that and, and games, um, many of which I've never talked about or showed that I've just played around with or collaborators have, have played around with um, I've done with collaborators or whatever. So some of the things are like in that 2017 Perl. Some of the things are like quine generation and synthesizing a pen. There are different ways you can synthesize a pen. So playing around with that. But anyway, that's the basic idea as for license. Okay. So, so all right. And so the author I played around with this a lot too. The author is not William E. Bird, which is normally what I'd put. It's Billy Bird, but Bill E. Bird, like, okay, so my family calls me Billy, but I go by Bill, this, <laughs> I just came up with this today. It'd be Bill space E period space Bird, because my middle name is Edward. So, you know, just like William E. Bird is a Billy Bird, uh, I just realized that that's, that actually sounds like Billy. So it's kind of funny. If you're not careful if you could, I tried putting them together, but then it looked like bile bird. You know, that's probably not great. Um, so anyway, that's also Toho project inspired. You know, so I mean, I could take a totally different handle like Zune or, you know, Zune, who's the creator. That's the handle of the creator of Toho project. He has this team Shanghai Alice, which is actually in Japanese, like, is closer translation is something like uh, Shanghai Fantasy Ensemble, something like that, which is a name I love. You know, I, I, I almost copied that so that sort of name, Fantasy Ensemble. It's like, eh, too close. So I don't know. And he's the only member of, of Team Shanghai Alice, which is even better. So I thought maybe, maybe I should have something like that where it's like my Dojin Circle. Um. And, uh, okay, so need a press. Okay, so this isn't MIT press. This is Unreasonable Schemers press. Um, unreasonable Schemers is a term that Fogus came up with. The, the Unreasonable Schemers press. Um, so I could self-publish that. Or actually, not, not self-publish it. It'd be my own imprint or something. I don't know. I, I feel like this book is something I want control over. Okay, so this is the trick. I don't want to be precious about it, but I don't know. Like I had complete control over my talk. Um if MIT Press had said, "Well, we want to vet your talk. We want to edit your talk. Uh, how about you put in this or whatever." It's like, "No, that's not you know, so I, I kind of feel the same way about this book. I don't know if that's me being precious. It's just like I want to do what I want to do with this book. I want the book to be the book I want to write. So I just don't, I don't know. I guess this goes back to the uh, Ken Achety, uh with all your might type thing or Neil Gaiman, you know, to talk about his eight rules for writing. And the last one is it's like with done, done with enough confidence and skill or something like that. You can, you can, uh, get away with anything. Um, you know, just tell the story the way you need to tell it. And so that's kind of how I feel here is that I just want to do it the way I want to do it. And being a Dogen work. So, so this is part of it. This is like me as a fan of relational programming. Okay. Not, not, this isn't a research work. This is, although it has researchy things in it, but it has really interesting ideas in it, but it's not a research work and it's not a textbook. Um, it's like a fan work, uh, by me as a fan of relational programming. And so CC by essay, so, uh, attribution, share alike. So it means, you know, derivative works are fine. Commercial version of it's fine. People could sell it if they wanted. Um, but they have to give attribution 
and they have to share alike. So if someone makes a derivative work, they also, you know, have to let other people have those rights. So it's like a viral Creative Commons license in that way. Um, what else? I'm just going through my notes here. Okay, so what do I want to focus on in this book? What I really want to focus on are the things that I find uh, really mind blowing. You know, so or the things people have responded to as being mind blowing. So obviously, things like quine generation, and we have different ways of generating quines. You know, programs that evaluate themselves, so that obviously would be in there. Um, things like synthesizing relational, I mean, uh, recursive functions, synthesizing things like append. There are different ways of doing that. Um, one way is by giving properties that are more abstract, not just giving specific input-output examples, but giving properties like associ associativity. There's a way to write that down that actually works in the, like the Barlaman interpreter. Um so anyway, these sorts of things. And I want to show some unusual behavior I've noticed that when when you have both a shallow and a deep embedding of Minikanrin in Minikanrin, you can get this interesting behavior where the shallow embedding, where you use like equal equal to implement equal equal, um, that's efficient. But you can't express run star semantics as far as I know. You can only express one run one. But if you do a deeper embedding where you actually implement unification as a relation in mini Canron, so this is something we haven't really shown. Um, you know, haven't given talks showing this stuff. Uh, you know, I've been doing work with a student on something called Meta Canron that shows us off. So. Uh, Baroth uh, has worked on Metacanron that shows deep embedding. Um, but anyway, there's some really interesting things that happen when you combine the shallow and the deep embeddings for the same language where you seem to be able to get the performance of the shallow embedding with the expressiveness of the deep embedding. And I've never seen anything quite like that before. So that, to me, is really interesting. There's also this... Um, when you have a mini Kenrin and mini Kenrin, you can now synthesize mini Kenrin relations and mini Kenrin queries. So that's interesting. Um, and then there's things like scheme and scheme and mini Kenrin and scheme that gives you a lot of expressive power. And, you know, I, I want to uh, investigate that sort of thing. Uh, there's staging, uh, there's having these towers of languages and then collapsing those. Um, what else? Combining the type inference and the interpreter in a way that is reasonable, and that might, you know, Michael Ballantyne has said that to do that well, we might need something like to implement the extended Andorra model of um, conjunction, which I have not <clears throat> been in a hurry to implement because it sounds really hard, but, you know, this book could be a good forcing function to, actually, all these ideas of, you know, mentioning, I think could be explored much deeper. And uh, so I think this book could be a forcing function on trying to push those ideas further. And also, I actually think part of what it would take to make this style of programming practical would require pushing on these areas. So it's like the awesomeness, where the awesomeness is in, in, in mini Canron or relational programming and where the pragmatic aspects could be in the future I think they're tightly related. Uh, so I think by really focusing on the aspects that are interesting, and sort of like nerd chill, mind blowing things, like uh, some fuzz testing or property based testing things as well, I think are interesting. Um, now, part of this. Okay, so if it's the imperishable wonderland then I don't want to be giving benchmarks on an Intel i9 or whatever, 
or something like that. That's like very perishable. And also, how do we do the code given that things like the staging implementation can be long or uh, faster mini Canrin's long or the Barlin interpreter with Greg's, uh, Greg Rosenblatt's um, fix-ups are complicated and that the staging system only runs in Racket right now, you know, all that. Um, I'm not sure. So, you know, one thing I learned from Dan Friedman if you look at little books, you know, the, there's nothing that happens in those little books, at least the sort of classic original ones, like Little Schemer, that happen, that, you know, that's recent. You know, all the art is old and things like that. These are timeless books. So, um, I don't know, these days they have a URL, but it, you could go back to the first versions of those books and really nothing's changed. So, uh, they have so, sort of this timelessness because they're about computation. They're about timeless ideas. And so I'd like this book to have that kind of feel. At the same time, you know, these are runnable computational artifacts. And so uh, that I'm not sure about. So I have to figure that one out. Um, one thing we, you know, that, that happens in the little books and like in the Reason Schemer, for example, is that that in that book everything's um, sliced into columns on the pages and frames, and there are these frame notes where within a frame note, you know, you're allowed to kind of talk about the rest of the world and computers and things like that if you want to. So maybe there's a moral equivalent of that where, um, you know, I, I think this book is going to be very very different than a little book. And I, and I intentionally don't want it to to copy off of other things. But there's probably some moral equivalent of, uh, of a frame note where, you know, it's like sort of encapsulating a side effect uh, to make it local. It's like there may be parts of the book or a, a companion or something, I don't know, that has the code or the... I'm not sure. Um, I haven't, haven't figured that one out yet. But, you know, some of the mind-blowing ideas... I think really are timeless and they, they are inherent to the relational approach. And then there are sort of pragmatic things about here's code that runs in this version of Dr. Racket on Intel or something, you know, that that's uh, very perishable. And, um, you know, or this is written in R5RS scheme, you know, whatever. So uh, I, I think that's a tension, but, you know, that's okay. Uh, I just have to think about it. Working in the open. Um, so that was part of the the deal. I was going to write these 11 books in the open. In the open means that I was going to record myself typing everything. Um, I was going to put everything on GitHub. Right. And then what ended up happening because of my wrist pain and all that, I was recording myself sometimes silently just trying to figure out Dvorak, how to type in Dvorak. Um, <laughs> yeah, those are great videos. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, I was talking also in some of those videos. I saw like 170 people watch one of these videos of me trying to type in Dvorak. Um, I think that was pretty funny. So... Uh, I personally got bored of that. I don't know if it's boring to watch, but it was boring to make. Uh, that, that was like one of the few times I really felt self-conscious. Like, wow. It was like, I'm bored just doing this. <clears throat> um, and then the other part is, it's, you know, kind of uncomfortable to work in the open. But the, the biggest thing was, well, I guess there were two things. At first I was thinking, well, maybe there's a book MIT Press wants, you know, before I decided to go for full doujinshi. Um, and so I'm not sure about the licensing because they were doing CC uh, by no derivatives, non-commercial, which over time I decided I didn't like that license. And then there's also, um, I don't know, like I was realizing I might have to do different drafts and is that embarrassing or am I going to feel like I get stuck or all that, but... My friend Michael Ballantyne said, well, that was an inspiring thing is watching you work in the open. Um, so I do want to work in the open 
to the extent I can. That's one reason I'm making this video. You know, uh, part of it is I got to figure out what it means to work in the open, in particular, to work in a way where I'll make progress. Because, like I like I said, what is it, what was it like for me working on the book late last night and this morning? Well, I was doing things like typing notes to myself on my iPhone and Apple Notes, and then or emailing myself an idea, um, or writing things down on a pad of paper, and then going to the coffee shop and you know thinking about things or pacing in my my room while I think about ideas. Um, that's how I actually work or, or taking a nap or laying down and just kind of like thinking about things or laying on the couch with the lights dimmed. You know, that's, that's actually how I write or work. I mean, at some point I have to type things, but even if I start typing things, it's more like I type some things and then I organize it and then I print it out and then I mark all that up. And then, you know, like literally there are times where I take scissors and I cut out the sentences and I move the sentences around um, because that's that's like a more direct manipulation way than than trying to type things in and edit that way. Um, <clears throat> so So the way I actually work when writing or preparing a talk or preparing a course or something, it's super idiosyncratic and there's not an easy way, like unless there's a film crew following me around all the time. And even then they can't see what's going on in my mind. You know, when here it looks like I'm asleep taking a nap. Actually I'm, I'm writing in some sense. Um, and that's what I have to do to make progress. So that was one reason I felt frustrating, frustrated, um, you know, with this epic arc with trying to figure out the perfect keyboard setup. You know, the truth is the keyboard part is like the least important part of the writing for me. Um, and, you know, day nine said, well, if you want to write a book, you have to sit in front of the keyboard and, and type at a keyboard. Well, that is probably true. Um, <clears throat> Although now with the, you know, the audio transcription, I've, I'm rethinking some of that. Um, but for this book, I don't even know if I want to typeset in LaTeX or do Markdown, or maybe I hand draw it. I mean, maybe I paint it or something. I mean, if it's a doujinshi, you know, part of the thing is I actually want to make my own artwork. I want to make my own cover, any artwork in it I want to do. I want to do all the layout. Um. I don't know, maybe I make a font, maybe I hand letter it, or, or I don't know. I um, Now, there is a danger that I never finish. There's a danger that I get too precious about it. Nope. Well, this session is going to end soon because I get a call. Um, I don't know, but, but I guess my point is I haven't made some of those decisions yet. I actually have made very few of those decisions. Maybe I just do it in LaTeX. Okay, maybe maybe I do that, or maybe I do it in multiple multiple formats. Or you know, I would actually like to have like a hardcover, nice version of this, even if it's just for myself. Even if there's only one copy made, that's for me. That's like a hardcover and I don't know, produced nicely. So I, I've been drawing pictures in my notebook of what that would look like. Um, so I, I don't know. I've never done anything like that. I don't know how to set up my own press. I've, I've read a little bit about it, but I want to have, you know, unreasonable schemers press, um, make it. So I got to figure out a lot of those things, but this is the, uh, actually with all my might type thing. Like this is the book I want to write. And I've thought about this for, for a long time now, for, for quite a few months, um, and sort of screwing up my courage to do it again. And yeah, so this book is different. Like if, if, um, yeah, like pulling it off will require me to figure out a bunch of things I don't know how to do. Um, but I mean, you could tell that it's been on my mind because I named the Discord server Imperishable Wonderland of Infinite Fun. I was thinking, well, you know, 
I don't have a book, but at least I have a cool title, so you know I can make a Discord. I I, I kind of didn't want to li- name the Discord server that because it's like, oh, you know, that's such a great name for a book. I don't want to really give it up. Um, it's like, yeah, I came back to it. That, by the way, is is a good sign for me. The things I really care about, I keep coming back to over and over again. And so this book, I haven't been able to get out of my head. Uh, I keep wanting to write this book. And I, I just have a different feeling about this book than the other ideas I've had. Um, I don't know. I don't think it's preciousness. It's just something different. Okay. Well, anyway, that's where I am right now. So I have made some decisions. I've got a provisional title. I'm going to do a CC by SA license. Um, I want to work in the open to the extent I can, but I'm still not exactly sure what that means. Um, because like I said, I don't even know if I'm going to, what the format of the book is and the format of the writing. And also this, this isn't a book that I'm going to do in a week. This is a book where part of it is trying to figure out the mind blowing ideas I want to talk about and, push some of those forward and figure out how can I talk about these ideas without getting tripped up with all sorts of sort of implementation details and whatever the state of what our mini Canron implementation I'm using is or the state of Shea scheme or racket. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things that are very perishable that I want to be very careful of. So I mean, even just making this video, I just had this idea. It's like, oh, maybe there are two books. Maybe there's, you know, maybe there's the book, which is um, the mind-blowing ideas, and then maybe there's the implementation book. Or maybe there's a virtual machine, or maybe there's an abstract language or something like that. Um, Yeah, I don't know. I I have to think about that. There's got to be some way to abstract over some of this at least. So I don't get tripped up. That's something that's been a problem in the past. All right. Well, that's uh, that's where I am right now. All right. Talk to you later. Bye.